Last time we did talk about the fact that a tesuit, in French we say God bless you instead of God bless you to your wishes. Um, so semi-presidential system, um, no checks and no, no very strong checks and balances in the system. It's a semi-presidential system, but um, we do not have similar structures such as those uh, we have in the US, for example, it, such as, I mean, as in the case of a presidential system. Um, the Fifth Republic had endured two major tests. One was the, um, the infamous alternation, the alternation from right to left. So a right wing coalition coming to I'm sorry, a left-wing coalition coming to power um, under a left-wing presidency uh, back in the 80s. This was thought to be a strong test for or of the Fifth Republic because there were worries that what if, given so much instability, so much bloodshed, revolution, um, counter-revolutions, what if the system gets rocked. Okay, so um, so so that was the first test. Um, Mitterrand's defeat of Gaullist right-wing, um, center-right or right-wing governments um, under Valéry Giscard d'Estaing. So uh, so that was the first um, test. The second test was cohabitation which means living together or residing together. Um, cohabitation as an institution, it was an unintended consequence of the Fifth Republic. I mean, um, the Founding Fathers did not expect this to happen. Cohabitation in this sense means that a right-wing president um, lives with or coexists with a um, left-wing a right-wing president co uh, coexisting with a left-wing um, majority in the parliament and the prime minister, um, or vice versa, a right-wing, a left-wing president uh, cohabiting with a um, the, the the opposite in terms of its ideological stance. Um, the longest period of cohabitation was uh, with Monsieur Chirac and Monsieur. Jospin, uh, from the mid-1990s, 1997, to the early 2000s, for about five years. So um, we had a right-wing president and a left-wing um, prime minister cohabiting. Um, this was feared by many, um, but France under cohabitation did quite well in terms of um, the efficiency and, and effectiveness of uh, the legislative ex uh, and, and the executive processes. And in fact, between 1986 and um, early 2000s, uh, mid 2000s, in, in that two decades, we had about 10 years of cohabitation in total, which was quite unthinkable. And, and it, the system worked quite well, which again, was not um, as intended or was not as expected. Um, that was in a way, a test to the Fifth Republic. Once again, this was a test in the sense that we had a history of fragmentation, political instability, you know, the pendulum swinging between radical democracy uh, and monarchy, strong executive, uh, weak, um, uh, weak legislature to uh, weak executive, strong legislature. So, um, so we had all kinds of swings back and forth between all these um, different sides of the pendulum. Um, but, but there were reforms to prevent cohabitation, such as the synchronization of um, the electoral cycles. Um, but still, we still had incidences of cohabitation. We now have the opposite of cohabitation, which is called, any ideas? The opposite of cohabitation. When we have a socialist president and a socialist prime minister, 
we have um, uh, we have um, President uh, Monsieur Hollande and um, Prime Minister Manuel Valls. So both are representing the same ideological stance. Both are representatives of the Parti Socialist Socialist Party or uh, Social Democratic Left Wing Party. So in that case, the opposite of cohabitation, we call that unified control. Okay? This is sometimes referred to as united control. Um, unified control, united control, it doesn't make a huge difference between the two. Um, let's see what the powers of the president are, if you excuse me. Um, the powers of the presidents, historically, have depended on, first, naturally, their constitutional powers. Um, the president, we know, is directly elected through a two-ballot system, which we've discussed before. The president, yes, he has. It's always been a he. Um, he's always had ceremonial powers um, as the head of the state or representing the, the French state. And he has political powers, important political powers. Um, he names the, president, uh, the prime minister and the cabinet, members of the cabinet, upon the suggestion um, of the prime minister. He presides over the council of ministers. The council of ministers is the inner cabinet uh, of the cabinet, uh, or, or certain members of the cabinet, high-ranking uh, ministers com are, are composing the Council of Ministers. He conducts foreign affairs. He directs armed forces. So he is foreseeing not only foreign affairs, but also uh, defense issues, defense policy matters. He has the ability to dissolve the Assemblée Nationale, the National Assembly, the Parliament, that is. Um, and he appoints about one-third, if I remember correctly, one-third of the members of the Constitutional Council, uh, the Constitutional Court in the system. Um, he is the only person, he's the only institution, the official, to arbitrate between state institutions. In fact, this was the main idea behind both the Fourth and the Fifth Republics. So in case of disputes, he was supposed to arbitrate between state institutions. Uh, for a smoother functioning of state uh, organs. He declares, or he may declare, emergency powers, as was the case recently. Uh, Monsieur Hollande declared emergency powers in France after um, the attacks, the recent attacks. Um, and he, propose, he may propose constitutional amendments on his own initiative, and he may call for a referendum on matters related to um, important policy initiatives. Um, so, so basically, his powers depend on the constitutional um, privileges he, he enjoys, the powers he enjoys. Um, but in addition to these, the power, the de facto power, these are the de jure powers of the present, um, their de facto powers depended much more so on their leadership skills. We had charismatic um, presidents, such as President de Gaulle and President Mitterrand, versus less charismatic presidents in history, uh, such as Monsieur Pompidou, President Pompidou, and President um, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing. Um, Monsieur Sarkozy, Monsieur Hollande, we'll see how they fare. Um, but in general, it's difficult to categorize them under the, the highly charismatic presence or the less charismatic presence as of now. So history will tell us um, how we'll, we'll perceive them with hindsight. Um, the institution of united control or unified control, once again, is when we have the two chief executives, the president and the prime minister, representing the same political faction, same political ideological uh, faction. So when, when both um, leaders are 
uh, representing the right-wing coalitions. Um, we have united control or vice versa when both president and um, the prime minister represent right, uh, left-wing coalitions. We have unite, united control or unified control. Once again, this is the opposite of cohabitation. Very good. Um, let's see what the prime minister does, uh, how he or she functions. Um, the government, according to the constitution, um, it is the prime minister who is really responsible for um, key decisions. So, so with the government, the prime minister makes key policy decisions especially with respect to domestic affairs. So domestic policies, it is the prime minister's remit, or it is under his or her control. Um, but de facto, we know that de facto situations, under de facto situations, the prime minister accepts president's leadership. And that's why um, we have, we call this system a semi-presidential system. Uh, because the government is still headed by the president, okay? In the sense that the president presides over the council of ministers, okay? So that's, that's important. Uh, the prime minister is appointed by the president. So after the general election takes place, uh, the president invites the chairman of the political party that has won the largest number of seats in the parliament and appoints that person um, as the prime minister. Um, the constitution really in this way designates um, the prime minister as key policy maker, um, especially once again when it comes to domestic policies because foreign and security and defense policies are under the, um, the privileges of the president. But when it comes to day-to-day -day management of the country, uh, especially with respect to domestic affairs, it is the prime minister who is responsible. Uh, and it, and, and in, in, um, in this way, uh, the president formulates policy in general, lays out the principles, but it is the prime minister and the cabinet who implements the policies, okay? Um, even, I mean, this is true even when we have external, we, ha we, we talk about external relations of the country. So it is, the pres it is under the um, presidential dire directorship or, or uh, it is under the leadership of the president, but the prime minister in fact implements uh, parts of those, um, those policies. And, and legislative functions, it is almost exclusively under the leadership of the prime minister because he or she is part and parcel of the National Assembly. Whereas the president cannot make laws, okay? So, so he's not a legislator um, in, that, in that respect. Um, and the prime minister coordinates the cabinet and members of the cabinet direct ministries and they may propose policies, but we do not see um, the cabinet as a forum for collective decision making. So, so, um, so we, we do not have an active um, cabinet, uh, you know, forming a, a strong pillar of the French system. Yes, there exists a cabinet, but it is under the leadership of the prime minister and, of course, um, the president. Um, bureaucracy and civil service, we know that in France, um, the powers of the bureaucracy had been increasing, uh, had been expanding, um, especially under the Fifth Republic from the 50s onwards. Um, <clears throat> we have over now 20%, more than 20% of the entire employment in France uh, working in the 
public sector. About 27 million um, employees being employed, workers being employed, uh, the labor force being employed, um, and um, more than 20 percent, which is about more than 5 million people working for the French civil service. So more than 5 million people uh, working for the French civil service. Almost 1 in 10 every Frenchman is working for the French civil service. Um, these figures are, um, these percentages differ from one country to another. In Turkey, this is about 12 to 13 percent of the total labor force. Um, in, in the UK, this is more than 23 percent. The British state has a larger uh, public sector. Um, Japan uh, was about 8 percent of the entire uh, workforce. And the US, uh, surprisingly, has a civil service of about 15 percent of the entire, 14 to 15 percent of the entire um, employment or, or the working uh, population. Members of the civil service have traditionally been, uh, top civil service I'm talking about, have traditionally been um, educated or trained at what's called the grandes écoles, the higher schools, the large schools, the prestigious schools. Um, they grant you know, um, tertiary deg degrees with all kinds of masters and um, I think they also have incorporate PhD degrees too. These are more like professional schools. Um, one is the ENA, ENA, École Nationale Administrative, uh, National School of Administration, um, which has been educating, training, I think all the presidents, I don't remember about Monsieur Sarkozy, but Monsieur Hollande, Monsieur Chirac, um, Monsieur Giscard, Giscard d'Estaing, were all uh, graduates of ENA. And most um, prime ministers uh, have been uh, graduates of, of this, this école, this, this school this administration, uh, administrative school. So uh, their powers and prestige have been um, very high. The French system had been highly meritocratic. And it was thanks to these grandes écoles that um, this meritocracy remained in place uh, with less politicization, with highly meritocratic systems in place. Um, the French bureaucracy uh, really um, represents or has been representing um, the principle of you know, meritocracy as opposed to the spoils system uh, elsewhere. Um, this was happening, this was taking place in France. So um, it was the symbol of um, power and prestige, but also meritocratic symbol of power and prestige. Um, the top, uh, top school, the ENA was located in, in Paris, uh, but now it is uh, relocated to, to Strasbourg, uh, which where, where the European institutions are. But um, over time, from the 1980s onwards, with the, uh, with the Mitterrand's U-turn, um, the bureaucracy has been losing its, its power, its prestige. Um, the, the idea of the rolling back the state, not only quantitatively, but also qualitatively, has been uh, undermining, um, undermining the idea of an insulated, excuse me, meritocratic, rational, Bavarian bureaucracy. Um, so reduced state activity through rolling back the state to a, to a some extent, and increasing power of the private sector with all rounds and rounds of privatizations back in the 1980s, um, accelerating in the 1990s, and an ideological shift toward the right uh, with the conservative revolution worldwide has or have been um, cascading to, um, to, uh, to result in um, the losing of prestige and power and status of the bureaucracy. Uh, we also have um, public and semi-public institutions um, 
state-owned enterprises have been very important historically in France, especially by the end of the uh, Second World War. Um, by 1946 or mid, I mean, before 1950s, I have some figures to, to um, tell you. Uh, the French state owned 98%, almost all, production of coal in the country. It owned 58% of banking sector. It owned about 30 per, 38 to 40% of the automotive sector. So Renault was one of the... Um, the pioneers in this respect. Um, but with the 1980s and 90s, Renault, um, Telecoms, um, France Telecom, um, and also Air France, I mean, the, even the minority shares in these have been sold uh, to the, fri the, the private sector. And the banks have been, um, have been privatized in time. Crédit Lyonnais, and also what used to be Société Générale, now it, the bank is, uh, was renamed as BMP, BNP. Uh, these were all um, state economic enterprises, or the state had golden shares, the state had um, huge shares in, um, in these firms, but now they're more private firms as opposed to public firms with the rounds and rounds of privatization in the country. Um, the judiciary, um, when we look at the judiciary, we have uh, the traditionally executive arm with little autonomy. Um, you know, the you know, judiciary had little autonomy under um, the executive, uh, the executive powers. Um, but we have seen the emergence of the constitutional court, uh, the Conseil Constitutionnel, uh, which has been enjoying increasingly um, powers, um, which is sometimes seen as a new check or a balance in the system. So remember we talked about the case that in the French case, in the, in the French government's uh, composition or the organization of state, we do not have a strong um, checks and balances um, integrated or subsumed in the system. But the, the rise of the constitutional court, the more, be, I mean, it being more active um, with an expanded access to the court, um, with a broadened jurisdiction of the court, we see the court as, in, or being um, a, a check and to a certain extent, a balance to or on the system. Uh, Sub-national government-wise, um, we have three layers. Um, we have 36,000 municipalities at the city level, 101 département, departments. Think of these as um, provinces. Um, 95 of these are in uh, mainland France, and the five are overseas. And we have 22 regional Government. So the administrative um, divisions are, are many. Um, but what's interesting is that um, they had been quite weak until the 1990s. Remember that this was a centralized state. Yes, it was a unitary state, but also it was a centralized unitary state. But there has been some loosening uh, with respect to that. Uh, some decentralization um, with the national government's supervision on or over local governments had been weakening uh, since 1980s. Um, creation of regional governments was new. This was a new phenomenon. And the local governments have started to levy new taxes. That's also new. So with, with more uh, or expanded administrative as well as financial powers, um, there has been some loosening of the grip of the central state uh, over the subnational governments. Please. Um, many ideas, of course, um, internationalization of norms, 
1980s were years of decentralization. The name of the game was decentralization. Uh, the name of the game was uh, increasingly subsidiarity, uh, increasingly um, make decisions at the, at the nearest level to the citizen. So democracy had been recast with a local um, and regional emphasis to it. So, so there was some kind of an ideological shift away from centralized state structures towards more open systems, open to, in addition to government, governance. So multi-tier, multi-actor, multi-level governance. So these were the ideas that um, were internationalized um, since the 1980s. And the idea of governance became so popular worldwide. Uh, democracy was, in, in that respect, redefined, revamped, recast. Um, and now we even talk about co-governance. So not only governance as multiple stakeholders at multiple levels, multiple tiers, um, multiple actors, um, but we also incorporate in contemporary um, democracy or democratic thinking or governance thinking, we see empirical examples of, um, of co-governance, which, um, which includes not only um, public actors, but also private actors, uh, in addition to civil society organizations, uh, public-private partnerships, um, and, and um, quasi-NGOs, NGOs, quangos, all of these as making up what we called the governance systems. So um, as opposed to one unitary centralized state directing, administering, we see the emergence of governance as an ideal still, um, but also to a certain extent in action. I would say it is um, the conservative revolution which paved the way for this, rolling back the state. Those ideas were instrumental, um, but also redefinition or redefining of democracy or what we understand from um, democracy as a political system had been changing since the late, I would say, mid-1980s uh, and all throughout the 1990s. Also, globalization helped, um, or globalization brought about these changes um, with um, global circulation of ideas. Um, once an idea is invented somewhere, if it is tested and true, it circulates. Currency of ideas. So, so all of these um, have been taking place all in all advanced industrialized societies. Uh, we've seen examples of those in the case of Britain, and we'll see more examples um, elsewhere as we, we discuss other cases. Um, so my point here is that, yes, subnational governments had not been as important, but from the 1980s, especially 1990s onwards, we've seen uh, an expanded role for these in governing France. Um, now let me briefly talk about policy making or day-to-day -day policy making or politics of day-to-day -day policy making. Um, one would expect policy making to differ vastly from cases or instances of unified control versus cohabitation. In which, um, in which system or in which situation do, would you expect policy making to be smoother, more effective, more efficient? Um, in unified control or in cohabitation? Logical, right? Because under unified control, the system works really, in effect, more like a presidential system, because the president has a presidential majority in the parliament, and they share values. They have similar perceptions of policy problems as well as policy solutions. 
So um, policymaking process becomes more smooth. In cohabitation, however, the system looks more like a parliamentary system in the sense that there is some opposition. Hmm? Uh, we have the president and the prime minister representing different political um, ideologies, uh, different um, spectrums or different um, points in the political spectrum. And um, there would be policymaking processes not as smooth, not as efficient as would be the case in uh, unified control. So, so that's, that's one uh, more like structural um, characteristic of the French semi-presidential system. So whether we have uh, cohabitation, then we can talk about more like a uh, parliamentary system, or we talk about or we have a system of unified control which, in which the president may act more independently and may really push through his agenda through um, the other parts of the executive as well as the legislature. So, so all of these will make a huge difference with respect to day-to-day -day workings of um, government in France. Another uh, element I'd like to talk about is policy autonomy. Um, advanced industrialized countries generally have less politicized, excuse me, um, highly meritocratic civil service. Um, they were, um, you know, top civil servants had been um, educated, trained at the Grandes Ecoles. So um, the French system, the French civil service system had been a, um, had been quite insulated from all kinds of political pressures. Um, don't forget, bureaucracy, um, policy making apparatuses are simply tentacles of the executive. They implement policies that the executive decides. But at the same time, the bureaucracy informs the executive. So, so there is a two-way traffic in terms of agenda setting, policy formulation, decision making, and implementation. So um, the um, top bureaucracy, yes, it will help implement the decisions being taken at the top, but um, the top bureaucracy will also um, inform the process of policy making in return. Please. So this is the situation which, is, which has in common with the British people. Exactly. So, so in this respect, uh, we have, in all advanced industrialized societies, uh, a, a largely independent bureaucracy insulated from political pressures. Yes, there is some lobbying, right? Uh, so pressure groups, interest groups are important. Uh, the bureaucracy will, will not be able to turn a blind eye to social movements and their needs and the organized interests from civil society actors. But uh, when it comes to the, um, the electoral cycle, uh, they're much more insulated uh, from uh, the political ranks. Please. Mm -hmm. the because they are uh, mm -hmm. visually organizing mm -hmm. in accordance with what they are told about the policy mm -hmm. uh, they implement the policy mm -hmm. so, so in, in time in time there has been um, as I as I was just trying to describe um, in time I mean there, the French system had been quite a closed system state society relations had been quite sharply demarcated against one another. Um, the, the state structure, uh, top bureaucrats were educated at the Grandes Ecoles and um, they were meritocratic appointments. So retention, promotion rules had been uh, not really politicized. 
But in time with the 1990s, we see increasing politicization uh, everywhere um, in advanced industrialized societies. So um, there is some concern with respect to the impartiality or partiality of the top bureaucrats. Um, in time, this has been changing. Uh, this is what I meant by um, politicization of bureaucracy in Britain, too. Um, and, and some segments of the bureaucracy are more, in general, uh, politicized than in others. Um, for example, in the British case, we've seen the police being more politicized than um, the financial um, bureaucracy uh, to a certain extent. So, so um, in France, we had uh, traditionally policy autonomy. Um, so the, the bureaucratic system was highly autonomous given the, um, the policymaking style. Uh, in the French case, we do not have a corporatist or neo-corporatist um, um, policymaking style, uh, which is like, in a way, the British style. Uh, so, so we have the bureaucratic system being quite closed to popular demands and demands from the upper echelons of the executive. So, um, so there are few opportunities um, that pressure groups can voice their interests. But this has been changing over time. So, so policy autonomy is being loosened up. And with the ideas of governance and co-governance, um, uh, civil society actors, pressure groups, or interest groups, uh, social movements have been uh, more vocal and have been more articulate. And the French state has been listening to these demands uh, more so than in the past. Please. Well, um, the president will not be able to do much um, in case um, a leader of the part or, or a party which is in opposition to, to his or her stance gets the highest number of seats in the parliament. So the, in the legislature, um, the prime minister and his cabinet has to gain a vote of confidence, has to you know, secure a vote of confidence. As long as the vote is secured, of course the president will be tempted to appoint um, his like-minded people or her like-minded people. But in actuality, what happens is um, Monsieur Mitterrand comes to power um, 1981, um, then uh, he has to, or he had to appoint uh, Monsieur Chirac because he had the largest uh, number of seats in the parliament, or he was controlling the largest number of seats in the parliament. So, so there was no other way. Um, I can't think of a president, nor can you, I'm sure, um, you know, being like appointing a leader of a party which will not be able to secure a vote of confidence. So um, it, all, it will all depend on the composition of the um, Assemblée Nationale, the, the National Assembly. So as long as the president, um, or as long as there is a prime minister or a candidate for a prime minister, um, is there who has the potential to win a vote of confidence, of course the president will be appointing his like-minded person or the faction or the political um, uh, party who would, be, um, who would be next to or near his, his ideas or who would, who would approximate his ideas. But in, in the absence of that, um, there's no way the president um, would appoint um, a member of the you know, potential opposition. Um, but, but yes, uh, this, is a, this is a question. And interestingly, the founding fathers of the Fifth Republic did not think of this. They were thinking, they were assuming that France will be led by center-right 
coalitions and that um, there won't be a contender or they didn't expect this. And for about 23 years, 1958 till 1981, right? That, that, makes about, that makes more than 20 years. 23 years, there was no incidence of cohabitation. It was all unified control under right-wing governments. The idea of cohabitation was therefore not debated. It was, in a way, unthinkable. Uh, there was no need to think about, to fantasize about these ideas until when we had Monsieur, Monsieur Mitterrand coming to power. Um, then um, a, a left-wing parliament, which was followed by a right-wing parliament. So, um, so for, for, for more than two decades, the, the initial two, first two decades of the... Um, the Fifth Republic, no need for cohabitation, but only then um, there was cohabitation. And in this respect, or in this way, um, many scholars of French politics really saw this alternation, this alternation from right to left with Monsieur Mitterrand coming to power as a strong test to the system because it, it brought with it the potential of cohabitation. So not only alternation, but also cohabitation was possible for the first time in the Fifth Republic. So, um, so, so, so these were, um, um, so coming back to policy autonomy, of course policy autonomy would differ when we have unified control or when we have cohabitation um, from the elected officials. Um, that would make a difference too. And finally, um, the EU had been imposing limits on the national policy autonomy. Um, EU directives through what's called the direct effect supersedes national legislation. Um, in fact, the EU treaties supersede the national parliaments. Um, so so um, from the 60s onwards, we have um, the EU's acquis communautaire, uh, which is basically all those treaties, um, agreements, um, directives, recommendations, opinions, all those policies really superseding French policies or domestically made policies, which in a way limits the policy autonomy of the civil service. Because um, we have, uh, when we were, um, you know, when, when I was about your age, um, 1990s, um, we, there was the, the urban legend that there were about 80,000 pages of the acquis communautaire that the EU was, um, the EU body of law, uh, all kinds of legislation, policies. There was, there was over 80,000 pages of acquis communautaire, which was really bearing down upon um, the national policymaking systems. Um, this has been increasing over time. I heard, I read somewhere that this has increased or this has expanded to 120,000 pages of uh, legislation, policies, this, that, and the other, what have you, um, which has been um, really constraining domestic national policy processes, and not only processes, but also uh, all kinds of decisions that national governments can take or cannot take. Okay, I think we should take a break now.